this morning our passage, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, just these three verses. So let's read all three verses together this morning here. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, Father, if you'll help me, I'll do my best to convey this truth, Lord, that has been on my heart. And I pray, Father, that it will be the thing that has been on yours as well. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't know how to title this today. <laughs> uh, I know you never suffer with anything like that. I struggle with what to So I just gave it this title. On this Missionary Sunday. Isn't that creative? On this Missionary Sunday, of all things. A number, I don't know if... Uh, if this is a thread that's going through many preachers' minds these days, but I've heard this a number of times in the last couple of weeks, and I don't mean this message, I mean uh, this theme that I'm on, and that is the fact that in our churches today, there are fewer and fewer people who are surrendering to the Lord's work full-time. I've seen it for a number of years, I've mentioned it a few times, but seems like recently, and I don't know where it started, <clears throat> I don't know if everybody's listening to the same preachers or what, but uh, they're talking about, it seems like out of our churches these days, young people are no longer surrendering to the work of the Lord. Well, they did maybe at one time and put it away later on. Um, and so it's happening right now in many of our churches, not all of our churches, but many of our churches. There are fewer and fewer young people, fewer and fewer people who are surrendering to the work of the Lord. Sometimes adults do, and I think that's a wonderful thing. We've seen that here in our church where adult people have surrendered their lives to serve the Lord or rededicated their lives to serve the Lord. But it seems like churches today, not just Timberline, but it includes Timberline, where there are fewer and fewer people who are saying, yes, I want to serve the Lord full time with my life. I w and I'm not talking about being a faithful uh, lay person. And thank God for every faithful lay person in this church and every church in America who has them. Not everybody is called to preach. Not everybody is called to do uh, missionary work. Not everybody is called to do those things. And that's true. But it seems like in our churches today, there are fewer and fewer who say, yes, Lord, I'll go. Yes, Lord, I'll serve. Yes, Lord, I'll surrender. God called me to Timberline Baptist Church in Manitou Springs, and I just want to say that God hasn't picked up the phone since for me, and I thank God for that. No, I'm not looking, and no, I'm not praying about anything like that. I am smack dab in the middle of where God wants me to be, and I'm not looking to change anything, and I don't make that a daily prayer request and say, Lord, if thou wouldest have me to go and do something else, please just let me know. I don't pray that prayer. I'm where God wants me to be, and I thank God for that. You say, are you open to God leading to anything else? Yes, of course. I would be silly, to, I would be wrong for me to say I'm not, but I'm not praying about it, okay? God's got my phone number. He can call me anytime he wants. All that to say this, when Brother Penn and I, 19 years ago, 19 years ago, in April, took a trip to Argentina, and we were there helping with our missionaries, in Tucumán, Argentina. And uh, I thank the Lord for that. Some said to me, my dad was included. Now, son, don't you go down there to Argentina and get called to the mission field. And I came back from Argentina. It's like, dad, don't worry. <laughs> There's not a bit of no hesitation at all. Don't worry, I'm not going to Argentina. It's not going to happen. And all the, I, you know, they say, never tell God you won't do something. Well, I've told God a lot of times I'm not going to be a missionary or not going to be a millionaire. I've told him I don't want to, I don't want to live in Florida. I've never, listen, 
God's not done any of those things. I love where I live. There's no more beautiful place in America than Colorado. And here we are at the foot of Pikes Peak, America's mountain. This is just the most beautiful place in all the world. Some of us, as I said to someone last week, some, some of us are called to suffer. We have to suffer in Colorado with all the beauty and all the animals and all the snow and all the mountains and all the beautiful aspen trees. Some of us are just called to suffer. What can I say? All that to bring us to this. When we got back from Argentina 19 years ago, I literally, when I got outside the airport, I fell down on my knees and my hands and I leaned down and I kissed the ground. And I found out that Americans are not spoiled. America, America is blessed in every way. So all Americans are spoiled. No, they just act like they're spoiled. They're blessed in America. I appreciated something Brother Penn said today in Sunday school. I don't always appreciate everything that he says. But I appreciated one thing that he said today. Uh, when he said, yeah, there are those that believe we're living in the great tribulation period right now as they're driving their nice cars and having meals to eat every time, every day. And uh, they've got nice clothing and they've got gasoline in their car and their bills are paid. Now we're not living in the Great Tribulation or the Tribulation at all. We are living in, I believe, a, tri a Tribulation time where many Christians are going through hard times right now. But that doesn't mean we're in the Great Tribulation. We learned when we got back that America is spoiled. The America is not spoiled, excuse me but America is blessed in every way. I thank God I wake up every day in a free country. I do. I sit down and eat meals. If I miss a meal, it's my own choice, not because I don't have anything to eat. I, I thank the Lord for that. I've counted my blessings so many times about living here and how God in all these years, my, my 68 years of living in my 59 years, you realize in February I'll be saved 60 years. I count my blessings every single day. I do. And I wish that you would do the same thing too. Because I guarantee you what, it'd keep a lot of bitterness out of your heart if you would. If you just learn to count your blessings, you see. But, but the question I want to ask is this. I said that we went there 19 years ago and I've got, we've gone back a couple of other times and all that. And uh, one time Brother Penn saved my life down there, which was very exciting. The sidewalks in Tucumán are kind of like this because they're all broken up. And I made a misstep and started heading toward the street. And he grabbed my arm and pulled me back on. Saved my life that day. Say, how do you know? <laughs> you ever seen anybody drive in Tucumán, Argentina? <laughs> it's, a, it's a racetrack on every lane. And only God knows how many people actually don't get killed down there. But the question I want to ask is this. Where does God get his missionaries? Where does he get them? He gets them in local churches, just like this one. You know, I think about that, even with the adults in this room today and some young people that are here, that God may even reach into Timberline Baptist Church yet and call somebody to go into the mission field. I don't know. But where does God get his missionaries? He gets them out of local churches. That's what he does. You know, uh, he gets them out of local churches and ministries where people are serving God and he gets missionaries like that. And it doesn't matter if it's in Tucumán, Argentina, a church there, or if it's in deepest, darkest Africa, or if it's some hut down in uh, Papua New Guinea. It doesn't matter. He calls people out of those local churches where the word of God is preached and the power of God is known. And he puts his hand on people and calls them into the ministry. He gets them out of local churches is what he does. And if he does, it's my, listen, what if God called one of you today? I don't know. Say, pastor, is that possible? Do you see how old I am or how young I am? Yes, I do see that. I do remember in Casper, Wyoming, that God was dealing with me at, with, at one point. And I remember one of our young people came forward during a preaching service and said, Pastor Dan, uh, I don't know what God is doing in my heart. He's just really working in my heart. Would you pray with me? They did not know that God was working in my heart at that time. And I've shared with you how the Lord was not changing my ministry, but changing an emphasis in my ministry. I found that out at a later time. But I did pray with that young person. And I thought, you know, 
is God dealing with me? And I once again surrendered to the mission field. I said, Lord, you want me to go to deepest, darkest Africa and deal someplace down in, 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 uh, in Australia with some aboriginal tribe way back in the back? Would you want me to do that, Lord? I, I surrender again to that. He never did call me to do that, but I made myself available to whatever he wanted. See, where's that young person now serving as a missionary? And, and uh, she and her husband are serving as missionaries in another country. I thought to myself, you know, where does God get his missionaries? It's out of local churches. Was God dealing with me? And listen, I don't know if it's because churches don't give opportunities for people or not, but maybe they need to start giving those opportunities to their young people and to their adults. Uh, I remember, and I know this is old news, don't let it go in one ear and out the other, please. Please don't do that. To me, these stories are just as fresh as they were the first day that I knew them. But I think about our own Bob Marvin. I think about our own Bob Marvin. How as a young person, he surrendered his life to serve the Lord, wasted a good part of his life, and in our church came back to God's perfect will and now is out serving God and preaching all over the place. I just And I thank the Lord for that. He said he's living his childhood dream. But where did it happen, ladies and gentlemen? It happened in a, in a local church. That's where it happened. It didn't happen in his cabin up on the mountain. Are you hearing? And that's where he lived. It was in a cabin up on the mountain, heated by a wood stove. And on the way to Cripple Creek, that cabin that he built up there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It didn't get, he, he surrendered in a local church is what he did. I think about one of our young men named Brian, and he surrendered right, right here in this church to go serve the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It happens in a local church. That's where God gets his servants, okay? He gets his servants out of Bible preaching churches. But why is that not happening anymore? I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't know. A lot of people can surmise those things. I don't know. I, I think about our young people through the years. A number of them had surrendered their lives to serve the Lord. And where at? Right here in a local church. It wasn't while they were sitting down playing a video game and it wasn't while they were uh, over at Walmart and it wasn't while they were out riding their bikes and skipping church. It happened right inside a local New Testament Bible preaching church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Where does God get his missionaries? He gets them out of places like this. Yeah, this little tiny spot on the map. You think about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, went to a meeting one night and was hiding basically uh, away from everybody. And I think there was just a bunch of women in the service and there's just a few people that were there. But during that service, Charles Haddon Spurgeon surrendered his life to serve the Lord. It happened where? In a local church. A local church. And sometimes the most unlikely of local churches is where it happens. And so what I'm saying all is simply this is that if God does call somebody in this room, or if God has called somebody in this room, uh, the truth of the matter is, my prayer is that those individuals be ready and willing to make a commitment to God and say, yes, I will do it. Yes, I will prepare. Yes, I will go. Yes, I will do what I can. And I will be what God has called me to be, instead of living my own little selfish life and, and, and nixing everything that God may be doing and working in my life. With that in mind, I want to share with you three important aspects to mid to the call to missions. And the first aspect is this, God's part in it. God's part in it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24, the word of God clearly says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Faithful is he who calleth you who will also do it. God's not looking for the talented. He's looking for the surrendered. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, God is faithful when we are not. And God, it's God's part to do the calling. It's God's part to do the calling. However, we offer excuses like Moses did, like Jeremiah did. And they offered excuses. I'm too this. I'm too that. I'm not a good speaker. I'm too young. And God comes back and says, you forget, I'm the one who made you. I'm the one who gave you your mouth. I'm the one who gave you who you are. I gave you the body that you've got. I gave you the mind that you have. And we forget all along that God is the one who gave us all of those things. And God is able to equip us and he's able to do it. 
The disciples were called to be disciples. Paul was called to be an apostle. And Peter was called to be an apostle. And a number of others were. And I want to say this. If God is calling you, or if God has called you, he's the one who will enable you to fulfill that calling, no matter who you are. What I am saying to all of us today is it's like God calling that the enabled Mary to be the mother of the Lord Jesus. It was God's calling that gave Joseph the ability to be a daddy to Jesus here on this earth. Think about that. See, what was Mary? She was just a sinner. And she, she called God her savior. And only a sinner needs a savior. And God enabled her to do that. Hear that. Hear what I'm saying. You see, it was God who called all, and it was God who called David to be king, the runt of the runt of the family in Israel. Little short, ruddy-faced guy that God put his hand on. And as the songwriter said so plainly, he said, when others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. And that's exactly what God saw in David, was a king. He didn't see a little short runt of a family. He didn't see a runt family that raised a runt man who had a runt son that had a little red faced, a little red faced Jewish boy. What he saw was he says, that's a king right there. And God enabled him to be just exactly that. You may not see much in yourself, but you know, God may see a diamond in the rough. If you've ever seen a diamond in the rough, they look like a rock. But somebody that can recognize what's inside that rock knows what's a diamond. Uh, listen, uh, a vein of gold in a rock or a strain of silver in the mountain or a missionary in the making. God can see those things when none of us can. Uh, God's calling is truly God's enabling. And don't ever doubt God's enabling. God is able to enable those who think they have no ability to do anything for God. And they say, I can't speak. I'm not smart. I'm too shy. I'm this. I'm that. I'm everything. God is the one who enables you, not you. You don't enable yourself. But then that's God's part. God does the calling. You don't do the calling. You're not mama called and papa sent. You're God called. And never lose that in your own heart and in your own mind. God may be dealing with you yet today. I don't know. God's ability in enabling someone is not limited by time, space, or age. But that's God's part. And that's God's business. But then secondly, there's your part. There is your part. John chapter 15 and verse 14. The Bible says, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. That's your part, to be obedient. That's your part. No one else's. Nobody can do it for you. It's your part. You say, oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Listen, I learned as a teen to be a yes man for God, and I mean that. I've not always been a good Christian, and I'm not saying I'm a good Christian now. In fact, if you know me well enough, you know that I'm not the kind of Christian that I ought to be. But I learned at an early age, you say yes to God. You don't fool around with God's command and God's prompting. You say yes to God. And you learn to be a yes man for God. And I'm saying this, you learn to say yes every time God prompts you to do something or be something or be a part of something. You learn to say, yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, to your will and to your way, as the songwriter wrote. I surrendered my life to serve the Lord February 9th, 1973. Oh, I've been saved for a number of years. I got saved at eight years of age, February 16th, 1964. And for a while we went to church and I didn't, then we dropped out of church for a long time. And I went back to church at the age of 15 to a Halloween party of all things that my youth pastor uh, was having there at the church. Yeah, and I did not look back and I kept going from that moment on. Did you really? Yes, I did. And what I'm saying is, is that it wasn't until 73 that when Tom Wallace preached in my church, and by the way, Tom Wallace is still preaching, and he friended us even on Facebook. And on occasion, I communicate back and forth with Dr. Tom Wallace. And I thank God he still, he still wins people to Christ. He's still preaching week after week in churches all across this nation. Way up in his 80s, he's still, still serving the Lord. He's the one that in my home church preached that sermon. There isn't any place anywhere near this place like this place. So this must be the place. 
I think he got that line from the Three Stooges, is what I think he did, because that's in one of their one of their episodes. But what I'm saying, it wasn't until 1973 that I said, "Yes, Lord, yes, I will do Your will." You've heard me tell the story. You know it as good or better than I do. You could fill in blanks if I tried to share the testimony, and I'm going to. And I were to leave something out of it, you could say, "You forgot to say this," because I've said it so many times. But after he preached in my church in that, that 1973, in that midwinter revival, and I got down on my knees on the, at the altar of our church on my left and your right of the pulpit, and no one prayed with me, and no one put their hand on my back, and no one filled out a decision card, and no one wrote down anything. But I remember the date, and I remember it well, and I remember what I said to the Lord. And on that night, remember what I did was I wrote God a blank check, spiritually speaking, and I signed it, and I said, you filled in whatever you want on that top line. I've not been as faithful as I need to be, but I've never taken that promise back. Never have. Say, how old were you? 17. And I'm glad that I made that decision. And I surrendered to the Lord on that day every bit of me. Say, what kind of talent did you have? None. Say, what kind of ability did you have? None. But I found out later on that God's calling is God's enabling. And Brother Penn and I were talking about this just this morning. He hated speech class. I loved it. I loved it. I couldn't wait to give the next speech. And you're talking to a guy who in 10th grade couldn't carry out a conversation with the opposite sex, let alone his own. A loner, shy, no ability, no natural talent, nothing at all. But God's calling is God's enabling. And I found that out to be very, very true. You see, the question I ask you today, no matter what your ability, no matter what your disability, no matter what your weakness, no matter what your strength, has God put his finger on you and breathed upon your life and said, I have something more for you than what you have right now because my calling is my enabling? We need to quit giving God excuses because God's got an answer for every excuse that we have. All I'm saying is, do preachers even preach anymore that people surrender their lives to the Lord? I don't know, but I think they need to. Do they save it for special meetings and for uh, <coughs> large conferences? Is that where they save that for, so that people surrender during those meetings? Or do they preach it in their own churches? Young people who were once called say, well, I'm older now and I've outgrown that. Oh, I was just young. Really? Have you thought about a few of the young people in the Bible that God called and they stayed with it and God used them? The calling of a child is just as real as the calling of an adult. Don't miss what I just said. The calling of a child is just as real and just as meaningful as the calling of an adult. Sadly today, there are many young people who adults say, nah, you were young. Don't ever tell a child he was young. Encourage them that maybe God was saying, hey, I'm calling you before the world gets ingrained into your heart, before the world fulfills your mind, and before the world fills you with its philosophy. I'm calling you now. And then what happens as the years pass? Oh, I was just a kid. Surely I didn't mean it. It happens to young people all the time. All the time. Say, do they have a right to change their calling? Well, of course they do. As long as they don't walk away from their calling. You see. Yeah, I've got some strong feelings about that. But maybe it's because I'm a pastor. And maybe it's because I'm a parent. And maybe it's because I've been in the ministry now full-time for 44 years. And I've seen a lot of young people and adults walk away from God's will. But then, of course, there's God's part. He does the calling. Don't ever, don't ever let dad or mom call you, okay? You gotta be God called. You don't wanna be mama called or papa sent. Don't wanna be that at all. And then, of course, there's our part, which is where we say yes to God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. First time I ever heard that song, it was sung by the Dear Marshall family as we were at a family conference many, or a family camp many, many years ago. 
and I'd never heard the song before. It was written by someone else, but they sang it. It's the most beautiful version of it I've ever heard, that, I, that I've ever heard since. I'll just say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. So there's God's part, there's our part, but what about the world's part, their part? The Bible says in Acts chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, it says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. I love this portion of scripture. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. There's their part. You can't make them. God deals with them. But there's the people that we have to reach. They're not going to reach themselves. If God calls you, you have a responsibility to obey him. You hear that? If God calls you, you have a responsibility to be obedient to him. It is not your job to save souls. It is not your job to bring revival. Those jobs belong exclusively to God and God alone. You're simply the messenger. But sadly, the messengers today have sewed their lips shut. They don't witness. They don't tell. They don't share the gospel. They don't give out gospel tracts. They don't do any of those things. Ask yourself, when was the last time you spoke to someone about Jesus? And I don't mean a Christian. You are the one who pleads for the lost to get saved, but it's not you who saves. If you, it is you who ought to do your best for Jesus. Dr. John Rice sang a song concerning that. The song writer, songwriter wrote these words. And I, I remember hearing John Rice for the very first time sing this song. It was in September, uh, October of 1974 at a Sword of the Lord conference. He sang the word, says, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree to think of his great sacrifice on Calvary? I know the Lord, my Lord expects the best from me. No longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? And no one could sing it like John Rice. No one. Your job is to go. Their job is to respond to God's message. And that's, but they can't respond if they don't hear. And Romans makes that so clear. How shall they hear, the Bible says, without a preacher? And that's not talking about a pastor standing behind a pulpit. It includes that. But it's not talking about that initially. A preacher is someone who simply proclaims the gospel. And that's in a restaurant or that is in a classroom or wherever it might be. Even in high school, there was a number of us from my home church. We got our hearts on, well, we didn't get them on fire. God put them on fire in my home church, in my, my, my public school. 3,000 students in my public school, 9, 10, 11, and 12th grade. I've gone back to that school a number of times since my graduation. It looks like a college campus now, so many students. I don't know how many A's you put after sports, but they're the highest A you could put on it. 4A, 5A, 6A, 10A, I have no idea. I mean, it literally looks like a college campus. There's so many there. And a number of us kids got on fire for God, just teenagers. We witnessed in between class times, and we witnessed and all that. I've told you about the young lady who was hair-lipped, and she couldn't talk very way, and she went, Mary, Mary, yeah. And so she got her a job working in the school library. That's quiet. Don't have to talk to anybody. She got to win seven people to Christ in one day, working in the library with a hair lip and, shy, and a shy personality. We used to meet in the middle of the hallway. We would rejoice and jump up and down and make a little circle and praise God when somebody got saved. And I remember in my German class, my teacher, my German teacher, I've told you this story. Don't, you could finish it for me. 
but I rejoice in it because of our teacher. He would teach us German for half the class. Mein Deutsch ist nicht so gut, okay? But then the rest of the class, we could do whatever we wanted as long as we didn't disturb anybody. I chose that time to witness to my classmates. I remember witnessing to one boy who, uh, he laughed and said he didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He didn't need him. But I remember a boy named Brian sitting on the other side of the classroom. He yelled over at me. He says, Dan, he said, I'd like to listen to that. I'd like to get saved. And I got to lead Brian to the Lord. Uh, I got to give the plan of salvation in my speech class for my final speech was, was God's simple plan of salvation. You did? Yeah, I started to give an invitation and the teacher stopped me and I said, but the invitation is part of my speech. She said, no, you can't do that. See what happened? A guy in class ended up getting saved that day because he listened to the plan of salvation. I witnessed to my philosophy teacher who was a, um, he was an atheist with a capital A. And on my, my final term paper, I wrote how to be saved, wrote the entire thing out, how to be saved. He marked all my mistakes because I was not a good art, uh, writer and I did not have good grammar and I did not know how to put commas in the right places and I would hang gerunds and suspend all kinds of stuff. I'd mess up my English at that time. He marked up my paper, but he looked up at me and said, I got the message, Dan. I got the message. I remember my, my physical science class when I was in high school. My teacher, his name was Frank. And he said, after I met him a few years later, he said, Dan, he said, Dan Parton. He said, I remember you. You've heard this story. You could finish it for me. And he said, I remember you. The only thing you and I ever agreed on was the fact that you and I disagreed. And I said, yes, sir, that's right. Then he started telling me about when he got saved. He, when he got saved. You never know what your witness is going to do to somebody. But the thing is, we say no to God rather than yes to him. Family members, and they're the hardest ones to witness to. Of all things, I remember witnessing to my papa Parton. I was scared to death. My heart was beating a mile a minute on that day. But I wanted to find out if my papa, my grandpa, my dad's dad, I wanted to know if he was saved. <laughs> he told me when he got saved, that blessed my heart. An old railroad worker. I learned a lesson from one of the lanterns that he carried. You know how the Bible says the word of God is a light and a lamp? I learned what that actually meant. Nobody had ever taught me, but I saw he had a, a lantern that had a light on the bottom of it and a light in the front. The light showed him where he was going, and the one on the bottom showed him the next step. And then I understood light and lamp in the word of God. I witnessed to my great-grandmother, bless her heart, Polly Clark, and I told you about that. She couldn't remember who I was from one moment to the next, but she told me when she got saved. And I'm saying to all of us today, God may or may not put the call on you to go to a mission field like I'm preaching about today or be a stand behind the pulpit or behind a lectern or <coughs> in a classroom or any of those things. But that doesn't mean you're not called to be a full-time Christian every single day of your life. And get the gospel out and quit giving excuse. The Great Commission commands all of us to go and share the gospel with the, with the lost. This old dying world is headed for hell. And today we're seeing it more clearly than we ever have in our entire lives. However, there are some who are specifically called to take the message to a specific place. I'm glad that our missionaries are called to the fields where they serve. I'm not called to go there. I'm called to go here. God Forgive me if I'm not faithful to the place that God has called me. And may God forgive you for not being faithful to the calling he's placed on you. Remember, there's three parts to this on this Mission Sunday. There's God's part. He does the calling. There's your part. That's to be a yes man or a yes lady to God. And then there's their part. But they can't do their part unless we do our part. We have to. How shall they hear without a preacher, the Bible says? How shall they hear without a proclaimer? <clears throat> How shall they hear without someone giving them the gospel, giving them a gospel track, whatever it might be? But yet week after week after week after week is passing past many of us. And yet there are those with whom we come in contact never one time hear the gospel or are given the gospel or anything else. God has already done his part. I just want to ask you, have you done your part? Have you done your part? Have you re-surrendered? By the way, surrendering, by the way, is not a one-time dealy. Is dealy a word? It is now. It's not a one-time dealy. 
That's why this man you're looking at right now has had many days over the last 59 years that he's been saved where he has had to go back to an altar, had to get on his face before God and say, Lord, I surrender again. I did, I've not gone back on my promises, but I've said, Lord, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. And I really mean that. And I think sometimes says, well, I did that years ago. Maybe you need to do it again. Maybe you need to say, here am I, Lord, whatever you want. Here am I, Lord, whatever you want. Because the only place God's getting his servants today are our Bible preaching faithful local churches. <laughs> My pastor, and uh, I just thought if I say this, you might think I'm talking about me, but I'm not. My pastor said one time, he said, the best preaching comes from tiny little churches that no one's ever heard of by one faithful man of God who stands behind his pulpit and fearlessly preaches the word of God. And I thought about that. This country's not made up of large churches. It's made up of just small, faithful places. So that's my message for today, is to do our part so that the world may do their part, which is respond to the gospel.